Today, we are <clears throat> extremely lucky to get a sneak preview of a paper which is not yet published. It's uh, from the 2022 volume of Allentonian Studies, which is very much in press. And I hope it will be with you, first of all, online, available online, and then in print form um, in the next few months. We're working on that at the moment. Um, but we do have a sneak, sneak preview of one of the papers um, from the journal today. We will be looking at spatial autocorrection analysis and the social organization of crop and herd management at Chatel Huyuk. And we have a veritable constellation of stars to present this paper to us today. Presenting the paper um, primarily will be Ian Hodder, who is Dunleavy Family Professor in the School of Humanities and Sciences at Stanford University. But we're extremely lucky to have all of his co-authors here too, who will be um, available to answer questions at the end of the talk. Um, they are Amy Bogard, who is school, head of the School of Archaeology and Professor of Neolithic and Bronze Age Archaeology at the University of Oxford. Claudia Engel, who is Academic Technology Specialist and Lecturer in the Department of Anthropology at Stanford University. Jessica Pearson, who is Professor of Bioarchaeology at the University of Liverpool. And Jesse Wolfhagen, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the Department of Anthropology in Purdue University. Um, I will encourage you to carry on using the chat for um, informal purposes to say hello to us and to say hello to each other. If you have questions regarding the paper, um, please type them in the Q&A box. You will find the Q&A box on the bottom black ribbon at the bottom of your screen. Um, please type your questions in there. That's when we will find the questions. And at the end of the paper, I'll, I'll put the questions to our speakers and they will um, address them um, in order. So without further ado, I will hand the mic over to you, Ian. So much, thank you. Um, it's really exciting to be able to talk to such a diverse global uh, audience. Um, about what must seem like a fairly obscure topic, spatial autocorrelation at Chattel Hoyo. But before I uh, started, um, I wanted to use this occasion to remember uh, Gina Coltard, um, who has been, had been at the British Institute uh, th throughout uh, the life of the Chattel Hoyo project. Uh, and while she was manager in London and then later um, in, in terms of the publications, the many publications that uh, we put through the British Institute. She was always a sort of um, quiet and warm, um, but highly efficient uh, person that I came to really respect and admire. Uh, um, it, it's an, a terrible and a very, very sad loss and she will be deeply missed. But I'm sure that everybody on the Chattel Hoyo project um, will, will want to join me in, in remembering her and perhaps dedicating this, this talk uh, to her. She was a very special uh, person. Let, let me share my um, screen. So I'd like to emphasize that so although I'm giving the talk, uh, I'm, my, the, um, rather speaking the talk, the, the, um, the, the co-authors um, are very much part of the work that, um, that I'm going to be summarizing. Uh, and um, I hope they will join in in terms of ask, answering questions at, at the end. But in addition to that, I want to be clear that I'm going to be talking about work that has been um, conducted and data that has been collected over um, 25 years by a very large and changing team. And uh, none of what I'm going to be saying today would be possible with, without the work of that, that army of, uh, of archeologists of various uh, hues and, uh, and various backgrounds. So, I'm just going to very briefly introduce um, Chattel Huyuk. Um, I think most of you have some idea of uh, the, the nature of the site. 
I'm going to be talking mainly about this eastern mound, the Neolithic mound, which is dated from about 7,100 to 6,000 uh, BC. Uh, I'm not talking about the western mound here. And I'm going to be talking about data we've collected from this north area, this sort of northern sub-mound here you might be able to see. And then also data from this southern area, uh, part of this sort of southern mound that you can just sort of see perhaps in this um, image. Um, the, in the northern, sorry, in the southern area where James Mellart had worked for a, uh, during, during the 60s, we were able to continue his um, trenches and, and dig down uh, deeper and over a, uh, an area within his excavation area. Uh, and that allowed us to get a sense of the overall stratigraphy uh, at the site, um, covering over a thousand years of occupation. And that has been continued on, on in right towards the top of the mound, particularly with work uh, conducted by Polish teams led by Arek Marciniak. Um, and then in the northern area, we um, have focused more on looking at the overall arrangement of houses, which is something I'll be talking about a lot today, um, and uh, being, being able gradually to build up some sort of image of uh, what the settlement might have looked like, a small part of it anyway, uh, during, during uh, any, at any particular moment uh, in the seventh millennium BCE. So, but the way that the paper that we wrote is structured, um, we first of all outline what the evidence is for the social organization of Chattelhuyu. Uh, we then look at how other types of evidence or a range of different types of evidence, I should say, um, about uh, crop management and animal husbandry, how they fit into uh, the evidence we have of social organization. And then the final part of the paper looks at what spatial autocorrelation can do uh, to contribute to our, um, our inferences uh, about the, the spatial organization and the social organization of uh, crop and herd management. So starting off with, you know, what, what the social organization was, um, I, I think one of the clear um, conclusions that has remained right from the beginning has been that whatever else is going on at Chattelview, uh, that the individual house uh, is an important social unit. And this has been demonstrated in a huge number of ways, uh, including uh, micromorphological analysis of the floors in these buildings that are very carefully cleaned on abandonment. But micromorphological analysis of floors and wall plasters has allowed us to uh, really demonstrate that a wide range of activities took place in these uh, houses, um, that the, the, these activities included uh, food preparation and food consumption, uh, tool manufacture, tool use, uh, and as well, many types of symbolic attributes. Most, most houses have at least one layer of painting somewhere in them at some point, and uh, most have a, a, at least one burial in. So there's a wide range of activities that take place in the house, and the house is a modular unit that is repeated over and over again uh, across the site. So the morphological work has been important. This just gives you some idea of the enormous complexity of the histories of these houses. This is work by Gesualdo Busaco, where he's looking at the, the, the sort of odd patches of painting that occur at different moments through the life histories of these houses, which are replastered and replastered hundreds and hundreds of times uh, during the occupation of the houses, which, is, which varies enormously from uh, 15 years to over 100 years. This is work by um, Harriet Klimovitz in, in one of the buildings, uh, building 132, uh, where he has uh, tr tried to demonstrate the way that uh, if we take a section uh, through one of the, the, the building 132, um, you see uh, the, the evidence of clean floors here in the northern part of the building, uh, where you have 
floors every now and then, which are cut down by burials. And then this bench here, uh, which you see over here, uh, the plastering going over that. And then in the southern part of the house, you see these dirty floors where you have a hearths and ovens and so on that take place. So really, we can demonstrate that there's a full range of functions in, in all houses. Uh, and that th this, this really does suggest that the, uh, the house the house entity, the house unit, uh, is an important aspect of the social organisation. But in addition to those individual units, there are also a, a very complex set of other types of associations and groupings that we've been able to discern. And one way of doing that has been the work that Camilla Matsukata has, has done using network analysis in order to um, evaluate the similarities between houses in terms of the artifacts and the architectural features found within the houses. So in this diagram, this network diagram uh, that Camilla has done, the, the individual uh, circles here are houses uh, and the squares are various variables like um, where the burials occur or which was the highest platform, whether there are pillars in the house, um, information about botanical and faunal remains and so on and so forth. And the closer together the circles are in this diagram, the more similar are houses. So two houses that occur very close together in this diagram um, are very similar. And her, her analyses, which are, uh, have been published and are very uh, complex, um, do, do have a very clear overall conclusion, which is that a lot of the variability uh, between houses is spatially organized in, in the sense simply that nearby houses tend to be more similar than faraway houses. So there's a clear, some sort of patterning, which suggests that there are groupings of houses that are, that cut, that are larger than the individual house. This type of uh, conclusion has been demonstrated in a number of ways now, and uh, this is just one example um, of the work of Milena Vasic, who was working here on uh, burial. And she uh, noticed that there are a series of houses uh, in the south area. Uh, you can see here these three houses here. Um, in, fact, in fact, they're three building lots, but they go through various different phases. So um, several houses, but in three building lots uh, in, in this part of the south area. And they have a whole series of very distinctive um, burial features uh, that you can see down here, things like wooden planks placed across the body or animals scat and pellets placed and so on. And th these are not found or rarely found elsewhere. And, and so this, this seems to be a small neighborhood, a small community of related houses. <laughs> What's interesting is that these similarities go through time. They're not all just in one level. There are different levels. So there's some sort of unit here which continues on through time that has some distinctive features. So this again suggesting clearly some sort of neighborhood um, or local community grouping of individual houses. Another, this is in the north area now switching over to there. And uh, there's another group of houses which um, again shows, uh, shows similarities and indeed connections between them, crawl holes between two of them. Um, but again, in terms of burial and other practices, these, ha these houses are very similar, suggesting another one of these sort of neighborhood groupings. In addition to these small groupings, there seem to be other sorts of divisions, although they don't seem to be so clearly marked out in terms of the artifactual uh, material. But one pattern that we've observed for a long time is these sort of radial wedges, you know, that, 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 that um, wall alignments or walls abut along these uh, linear zones, suggesting radial wedges that, that sort of extend, extend out from the high points of the mound uh, down to the skirts of the mound. So there are these radial wedges, but there are also these, this zone here, you can see a zone of open, um, where there are no houses, of, 
full of refuse. We don't think these are really streets in a proper sense, but they seem to be areas of refuse that people were dumping between two communities, if you like, two sectors. So um, here there's one big sector of houses here, and then a zone between them and another group of houses over here. So you have the individual house within a neighborhood house group, within sectors, sorry, within wedges and within sectors. So you have then a series of nested groupings, the individual house uh, within neighborhood groupings, within wedges within sectors and also there are divisions between the northern the south northern and the southern parts of the east mound but there are also a whole series of complex cross-cutting um, relationships so chatwick is well known for the fact that there are some buildings which are more elaborate than others and these more elaborate buildings with bull's horns and so on also tend to have more burial and so you can have up to 62 people buried within one house the fact that you have 62 people buried in a house and often other large numbers of people uh, suggests that the people buried in the house um, were not were not just the people who lived in that small house that they they must have been buried in from other houses so it seems like some more elaborate houses were preferentially used for burial. And this relationship between um, burial uh, numbers and elaboration of the house, symbolic and other types of elaboration is shown in these, in these diagrams here. More elaborate houses uh, have individuals contributed to them from in terms of burial from a, a group of a group of houses that we don't know where they are we don't know where people were buried from my own view is that there is some evidence to suggest that the people who were buried uh, in the houses were not these neighborhood groups they were some larger cross-cutting groups and it's also the case that these more elaborate houses often have you know the famous chattelhuyuk symbols like leopard reliefs or splayed figures that we now think of as bears and so on that these um these more these very distinctive features are not found clustered together the chattel here they're spread around the site as a whole so for example we found a splayed figure in the north area uh, and, but then they're also found in the south area so there's these far-flung connections um in terms of the distinctive symbols Chattel here, some sort of connection between widely spaced elaborate houses uh, in terms of the symbolic attributes. Some of the other cross cutting relationships are, are very intriguing. Um, th this is work that was done by Pilou and Larson looking at uh, teeth as proxies for genetic similarity or genetic distance. Uh, of individuals and on the left here you can see both in the north and south the buildings that they sampled from and then they took these detailed teeth measurements and these dendrograms put together individuals that are very similar in terms of their teeth but what you find is that those individuals are not buried in the same house so that somehow or other uh, people are being mixed up um, during life and death uh, such that um, the people who are, are buried uh, together um, did not uh, are, are not genetically closely related. These are not nuclear families, all living happily in individual houses. There's something much more complex going on with individuals being moved around. And this has been uh, supported by the work by Mehmet Samal and his team um where if you look at the groupings of people look at the ancient dna of the groupings of people found buried together in houses the the, the, the lack of relatives the lack of close relatives at chattel 
is very marked in contrast to uh, other sites, particularly earlier sites like uh, Bonjuklu. So again, there seems to be some complex way in which people had presumably biological parents, but they also had other, other types of kin or other types of relationship which cross cut uh, the individual houses or the groups of houses that are um, in the co-burying pattern. So this is all very um, complex, and I and I tried here to give you some idea of of the way I see see this. Um, this is a diagram actually based on Krober's work on the Zuni, on Zuni social structure, but the idea is that an individual house or an individual person in a house uh, has um, people within that house and within the neighborhood that they can call upon in times of hardship or uh, in terms of sharing food. Uh, but that there are also radial wedges and sectors and submounds and the mound as a whole, various sort of nested groupings um, that, that one finds uh, at the site. But they're cross-cutting this. There are various types of other association, biological kin, burial groupings, and perhaps types of various types of sodality expressed by these famous symbols, the leopards and the bear and so on, cross-cutting that. We don't exactly know what the, all these cross-cutting things were, but we have a clear indication that some, something like that existed. So an extremely complex system uh, in, in which there was much movement, there must be much, much exchange of, of artifacts and information and food uh, sharing various types between these uh, uh, different levels. It all suggests that, that any sort of patterning in terms of neighborhoods and so on might get blurred or smoothed over by this very complex process of mixing and sharing and cross-cutting. And this, this Im implication has been uh, reinforced by the work of Kevin Kay, who has taken a series of houses and looked in very detailed, in a very detailed way, at the Harris matrices, and shown that uh, any particular house was very um, cha changeable. There was a lot of variability through time in uh, the number of people who were buried uh, and the, the amount of symbolic elaboration, but also in terms of the number of bins and ovens and hearths uh, that were in use in the house. So, so that in some houses, there are clear periods where there are no ovens or hearths. Uh, and in fact, that, that occurs, that, that is found in, in, most, in most buildings. There are phases without hearths and ovens, which suggests again, that there must have been times when individual houses were, were involved in these complex sharing processes in terms of food production and consumption. So what all this means is that if we're trying to use spatial autocorrelation or other types of analytical technique in order to look for neighborhood groupings, clear sort of patterns in terms of crop and herd management, it's going to be very hard uh, because of these very complex social relationships. But we might hope that there will be some way that um, the, the social organization would, would show itself in that type of uh, data. I also need to introduce at this point the, the chronology of Chateau, um, going from the bottom to the top here. We have um, been using our own uh, scheme of levels for the south and the north area, and the TP, the um, uh, Osnan work, uh, and the Istanbul area. And we've tried to relate those to the Melart sequence, although it doesn't really correlate uh, terribly effectively. And then on the right, you see the dates. And what I've been talking about mostly in general terms is really about this middle phase here. Things change quite a bit as we will see in the late phase. And we don't, we have much less information about the early stage, but again, things might be slightly different there. There's, there's quite a major change uh, at um, around 6,500 here. There are also important changes that take place up here at the top, but I'm not going to be talking about that so much in this talk. 
So what is the, I've, I've been describing the social organization at Chattahuya, what is the existing evidence for crop and herd management and the organization of consumption in relation to um, this sort of uh, pattern of social organization? And again, it's clear that um, the individual house is an important production and consumption uh, unit, however much else is, is going on. That the, the houses have a, a clear pattern uh, of side rooms, uh, these sort of side rooms which are used for storage and some sorts of food uh, preparation or often. Uh, and then um, we have lots of evidence of crops and other materials being brought through and, and processed and managed, particularly in the southern area of the house where you have the hearths and ovens and what we call the dirty, the dirty floors. Um, and so th this, th this is a picture of, of, that, of that house. <laughs> so lots and lots of evidence that um, crop and faunal material is processed and managed uh, at different scales, but at least one of the scales is at, is at the, the house level. Work by Amy Bogard and the archaeobotanical team has uh, been very effective at plotting out um, differences uh, in the use of uh, different ty types of um, crops and, and dung fuel, um, different types of fuel in different parts of houses. Here you can see the sort of higher concentrations of uh, dung uh, pellets, probably indicating um, use of dung in um, outdoor fire spots, as opposed to the, the lower densities uh, inside this house, this building here. Um, so lo lots, of, lots of evidence from the archaeobotanical team of the way that um, crops were stored and then uh, taken out of the bins and dehusked and uh, and processed and pounded and and then made into bread and uh, gruel of various sorts. So so lots of evidence that this is going on uh, at the household, at the house. Well, sorry, the house level. <laughs> There's also evidence that um, the archaeobotanical team uh, describe uh, in that, in our paper for. Um, some sort of um, grouping or organization of crop management uh, beyond the individual house. So the archaeobotanical evidence for weed assemblages associated with cropping suggests that buildings that were directly adjacent, such as building 79 and 80 in the south, were located in the same neighborhood or in the same sector of the settlement, shared particular similarities in weed flora suggesting some form of super household organization of land use. Other interesting evidence uh, that has come to light has been uh, based on the work of Jessica Pearson on the isotopes, carbon and nitrogen isotopes. And we will be looking at other examples of this in a minute. But this is taking individuals uh, buried, humans, individual, humans buried um, in different houses uh, at Chattelhuyu and showing that there's quite a lot of clustering of um, diets associated with individual houses. And um, working with Claudia on the statistics, the statistical evidence of this, this is clearly significant patterning, clearly significant differences between houses uh, in terms of um, in terms of the carbon and nitrogen uh, diets. But these are people who are not necessarily living in that house. These are groups of people uh, who were in these cross-cutting burial groups um, that were buried within the house together. So the people buried in a house may have uh, eaten together or in some way been involved in a food processing, uh, production and processing together. <laughs> so there is evidence uh, for differences in terms of crop management and herd management at the um, 
campus level and at the groupings of and in terms of groupings of various sorts both neighborhoods and cross-cutting groupings within within the the um, the site there is also some evidence that there are interesting differences between the northern area and the south area it's very tempting to say that these northern excavations represent this northern submound uh, and and this that this excavations represent this 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 southern south this southern submound that's of course difficult we don't know what what's happening in these other areas but the nev nevertheless there do seem to be di overall differences between the, the north and the south particularly in the timing of when things happen and uh, I, I'm not going to read through this. Uh, the main point is just for you to sort of glance through it and to see to see ways in which um, the, the in innovations in terms of new types of crop or the domesticated cattle cattle um, seem to have happened at different times in the north and the, in the north and the south. They, they don't seem to be. They seem to be delayed, or one of them is delayed in relation to the other in a very sort of complex way. For example, domesticated cattle, cattle were probably present in, in, in the north at the same time, but in the same time in the south, uh, they, they don't seem to be there. And, and so there's all sorts of interesting patterns like that, suggesting that there, seem, that there is some sort of separation in terms of um, the, crop and man, the, the crop and herd management in the, in the north and the south areas. So finally, we can come to a spatial autocorrelation, and spatial autocorrelation, uh, for me, is is a wonderful sort of uh, return back to my early days in archaeology, where in spatial analysis and archaeology, I got very excited by the use of spatial autocorrelation. Uh, worked on it then, but haven't since. And then, and then the data from Chattal has allowed us to to explore spatial autocorrelation again. What spatial autocorrelation analysis does is, is simply asking whether any particular variable um, is, is spatially patterned. Uh, and, and in particular, it's looking at whether any particular variables, for example, uh, an isotope value for sheep bones or something, whether uh, that value um, suggests that nearby values are more similar than far away values. So it's whether it's really asking whether a particular variable is autocorrelated, in other words, correlated with itself spatially. Now we have done in the past, uh, and this is not not talked about so much in the paper. In the past, we have uh, done a, a range of different types of autocorrelation analyses, uh, particularly the work by Camilla Matsukato, where she's looking here, for example, at the just the overall density of the material in houses and middens and seeing some sort of apparent uh, clustering or patterning whereby nearby houses or houses and middens uh, seem to have similar sorts of densities of uh, material. And uh, you probably can't see this very much, but this is a work on um, human isotopes. Uh, and the, the sample size in this earlier work is not very, high but you you can see these little um, di diamond symbols where we have samples uh, that were able to be analyzed and uh, the work that was done then showed this sort of grouping of ex very ex sort of extreme values uh, in this particular uh, building and uh, in fact in the same building through time for again the, th this is a pattern that, that it continues from one level to the next suggesting that there is some sort of distinct diet associated with this particular uh, group of people buried in these houses. But for this particular paper, we were using uh, Mor Moran's eye statistic for spatial autocorrelation, which varies from minus one, suggesting uh, complete dispersion of values, to zero, uh, where there is a random spread of values, to plus one, which suggests a very tight uh, clustering of values. So one example of this uh, work uh, is the distribution of carbon and nitrogen isotope values for sheep bones uh, analyzed at uh, Chattelhuyuk. 
and you can see here the nitrogen and carbon carb, carbon range of uh, variable, the range of data that was found there. And this is the sort of result that uh, we're getting. Um, so in, in, these, in these tables that I'm going to be showing you, uh, statistically significant results are, are shown uh, as bold. So if we're looking at the carbon uh, for sheep bones, what we're finding here is that we do have um, a significant value in the early, but not in the middle, and significant value in, in, the, in late, and similarly uh, for the nitrogen. So what, one thing to notice is that the, that the values above the clustering, the degree, the degree of clustering above zero is not high. These are all fairly low values. And as I've said before, this is in a way what you might expect given the, the massive amount of sharing and cross-cutting cross and dispersal of, um, of data um, at Chattahuya. But what we are apparently seeing is that even though the degree of clustering of values is not very high, it does seem to be higher in the late period, both in terms of the carbon and the nitrogen. So what this is perhaps suggesting is that there is some slight evidence of um, some sort of spatial in the way that sheep are herded and grazed uh, in the environment and that this slight patterning is slightly greater in the late period. So that this fits in with our other evidence, if you like, that there is some sort of nested spatial patterning in the social organization at Chattahuya, but there's also a lot of cross-cut cutting complexity. This, um, th that last table is supported for the late phase by this uh, diagram, which is showing uh, values uh, for sheep uh, isotopes in the middens associated with two uh, buildings in the late phase. So here there's a sequence of buildings, and then you've got these middens around it. And here there's another building with um, mid middens associated with it. What you see clearly is that the, 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 the two groups of sheep bones are very similar, very different uh, in terms of the uh, isotopes. And um, uh, th this suggests that the sheep, or could suggest that the sheep were being herded in different parts of the landscape or in different ways in some way in terms of the landscape. There are a whole series of other ways of interpreting this. And a lot of caveats need to be brought in. So for example, one is that um, the, it may be that uh, there, there was more variation through time in this, in this group on the right. Uh, uh, and it is the case that these samples cover, uh, 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 appear to cover a longer range of time than the group on the left. But when I tried to sort of break it down by, um, by level, to look at just contemporary results, I got a similar sort of pattern, although not as clear as this. There are also other possible, possible reasons for the difference. One is simply that the the middens are, are a bit different type, different types of midden, with the ones on the right being more uh, diverse than the middens on the left. But um, the, the, archaeo the archaeologists who excavated these deposits argue that in fact the opposite seems true, that the, the middens on the left seem more diverse than the ones on the right. Um, other possibilities are that, you know, that the ones on the right are from a different season than the ones on the left and so on and so forth. We go on with various types of um, other explanations. But uh, certainly one, one explanation is, is that, um, uh, that, that there are 
differences in the way these two groups, these two series of buildings over time uh, are managing their herds, at least their sheep herds. <laughs> now, this is something that's particularly distinctive in the late period. So this is another uh, set of autocorrelation results uh, based now on the um, uh, archaeobotanical wor work on weed densities, uh, looking to see whether differences in weed assemblages give an indication of different uh, parts of the landscape or different environments in the landscape being, being used. There's a, a difficulty here in terms of um, the sample sizes. There are, there are often much too small numbers of these types of weed seeds that have been analyzed from any particular uh, deposit. So we've included just samples with more than 10 seeds, but even so that's a small, more small number. Um, and very many of the weed seeds don't show any patterning at all. What, what I've shown here So I'm sorry about that, but here, here um, we're, we're looking at the spatial autocorrelation for, for weed densities in deposits of different data at Chattel <clears throat> and, um, Again, for, for many of these uh, results, we're, we're not getting patterning that suggests clustering, but the clustering that we do get tends to be for these later, these later phases. Uh, if any of you are interested in what exactly these weed species are, I, I look forward to um, Amy explaining them to us um, at, at the end of the talk. And then finally, uh, this is um, uh, looking at the densities of weed seeds in dung samples um, from the middle and late periods in the north and south of Chattelview. And again, you'll see that very often there is no real significant uh, patterning. Uh, the only example that does does show some sort of patterning is in the late period again. So conforming to that pattern of the late being more clustered. Um, and it's interesting that the, the these, these are looking at internal uh, samples, that's internal to a house, whereas the external deposits, that's you know fire spots and things outside houses, uh, don't show the same sort of patterning. And this fits very much in with work that Justine Isavi has done on the nature of middens, which tend to, which tend to be much more mixed uh, than the deposits inside houses, which are much more, which show less variability. So in conclusion, um, the spatial autocorrelation results reported in this paper are compatible with existing work, both on crop and herd management and consumption at Chattelview and on the social organization of the settlement. Individuals had numerous others they could exchange and share with at many scales within a nested hierarchy of groupings, as well as in cross-cutting sodalities. As a result, most residues of production and consumption are spread across the settlement in what looks like a fairly random manner. And it's interesting that this um, type of work has been undertaken at Kurtik Tepe, PPNA, and produce similar sorts of results. But it's very important to recognize that there are depositional and post-depositional processes that are likely to have smoothed out any original clustering. So it's possible that you did, you did have originally quite clustered organization, but that this has been smoothed out um, by depositional and post-depositional processes. And these processes include temporal blurring so I've tried to emphasize that these buildings changed a lot through time uh, and the middens associated with them changed a lot through time. So what, what, what might have been true at one moment might not have been true 10 years later or even one year later. So there's a lot of blurring going on because of temporal change. The, there also seem to have been lots of uh, change through time in foraging habits through time um, variability and depositional processes in middens. The middens are really quite diverse in terms of how they were constructed. 
and there were many and there are many uncertainties in identifying weed species in non-storage contexts. Other confounding factors include the relative uniformity of mile-based soils and vegetation across parts of the Konya Plain, in contrast to the wet and dry mosaic of alluvial environments near Chatelhuyuk itself. And, and so what I find odd, you know, strange, is that despite all this mixing and sharing and despite all the blurring and post-depositional um, smudging that's gone on, there seem to be some faint traces of some sort of clustered patterning which sort of seeps through uh, the data, especially by the late period of occupation at Chattelhuyu, but also apparent in some instances in the middle period, there is evidence of distinct labor and consumption organization linked to house groupings and larger scale entities in the nested hierarchy. And, um, and this is somewhat parallel to results that have been obtained from Tel Halula and the PPNB. Sample sizes for the early period are, are really small, and so we must await for, for, for further research on the early levels before the change through time can be confirmed. But the development observed is compatible with claims for increased independence of house-based groups in the late period. This result is similar to the use of different cultivation areas in the surrounding landscape by house groups in linear band ceramic settlements in Germany, as Amy Bogart has shown. But it's also compatible with the widespread evidence from the Middle East of greater household or greater house autonomy uh, through time. So that's it. Thank you very much. Hello, thank you. Thank you very, very much, Ian. I would like to welcome or encourage all of our other um, authors, the co-authors on this paper to return to us on the screen, please, so that you can all um, take part in the answering of questions. Um, for all of you in the audience, please do not hesitate to uh, type your questions into the Q&A box and from there I shall relay them on to uh, the authors of this paper. But while you are all thinking, and I'm sure you are all cogitating on this, um, I'm, I'm going to, to start with a layman's question, um, if I may, please. And that is the extent to which you think these depositional and post-depositional factors have blurred our perspective. You seem to to hint that you think that actually there would be clustering there if only these uh, various depositional and post-depositional factors had not got in the way. Um, do, you, do you think that actually these patterns would be stronger? Um, they would originally have been stronger. Um, I, it's obviously a difficult question to answer whether they would be stronger, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think there were also um, uh, processes going on in the, within the social organization in the Neolithic that might have made it difficult to see clear patterning anyway. But um, I, 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 I don't know whether any of the others have anything to say about the depositional, post-depositional stuff. I, I know that's a big problem for the botanical and the faunal material. Maybe I can just come in there for a second and say that where we have been able to tease out patterns, it's where we have tried to control for um, taphonomic blurring by, for example, looking at plant material that was burned in situ. So factoring out anything that is secondary tertiary and looking at what is pinned down spatially through, through burning. And then we do get some. Uh, so. I think that does suggest that if you if you peel back some of the taphonomic complexity, that that you certainly get more patterning. <laughs> Great. So there would have been um, more there. I think we've got our first question coming um, from Graham Barker. Hello, Graham. Who asks? Do you see hints of sodalities at other Neolithic sites, either within the region or beyond? You want me to answer that, you guys? <laughs> you, you, you have something to say about it for the bank ceramic. 
maybe? Yeah, no, we do. I mean, I think there is, uh, in these very diverse locations, times and places, evidence uh, as you outlined, Ian, not just for the distinctiveness of households, but for neighboring household groups. Uh, and that that would appear to be a convergent feature that we are finding in just, you know, wackily different times and places and uh, could then be a sort of convergent feature. I, me I mentioned similar results from Halula and um, uh, not, not very many sites have been subjected to the same type of very detailed analysis. So it's, it's difficult to really draw comparisons. But um, my, my view is that Ashik Lahuyuk, for example, um, must have some sort of super household stuff there because the, the hearths and you have these long sequences of buildings that have hearths and burials and then other buildings around that don't have hearths and burials and so it suggests to me that there's some sort of you know larger grouping there so i think i think yeah i think it's always there but and particularly through time i think it's less visible early on but but through time i think it's i think there is evidence Fantastic. We've got a question from Trevor Watkins, who asks, from what you know about the environment around the settlement, would you expect in ideal circumstances that there would be distinctions in, for example, where sheep were grazed? Or would there have been limited areas of really good soil for crop cultivation? One of you answer. <laughs> So shall I, shall I just say something on the crop side and then I can yes. hand it over? Sorry, folks, it's just it, when you're in a virtual room, it's hard to make eye contact <laughs> to know who should go next. Um, so it is a complex setting uh, that's deliberately chosen um, for the community, I mean, to be established here. Um, and we've, we've been working um, with uh, Jana Ayala in Sheffield and John Wainwright in Durham lately on uh, the sedimentology and the, the, the complexity, the variability that you see even over short distances. Um, so it looks like we are dealing with an anastomosing uh, channel belt uh, to one side of the site largely, uh, which offers uh, a whole range of hydrologies, uh, levels of wetness, sort of predictability of wetness with um, drier conditions as you move away from that belt. Uh, so I'm just trying to give you a sense that even just in terms of seasonal variation within a year, there is a lot of um, dynamism and different niches and options in terms of wetness. And, and I emphasize water because that would be the primary limiting factor for growth. So that's on an axis extending away from the river. And then on a different uh, spatial axis, if you just picture moving away from the mound itself, even if people aren't deliberately uh, spreading dung, uh, there will just be a drop off in organic matter um, of human and animal origin as you move away from the settlement itself. Uh, so those are two, in terms of crop um, and plant growth uh, and the sort of abundance of growth, those are two key factors, water and nutrients that will be varying in, in, in slightly cross-cutting directions and creating uh, particularly fertile and well-watered conditions on the channel belt side of the mound and near the mound and then drier and with less organic matter of anthropogenic origin as you move away. Uh, so that there's, there's going to be variability. And I think part of the reason then that we see some spatial coherence in the weed flora is that, that people's uh, cultivation plots are not randomly located in this landscape, but they may in fact have a principle of sharing the, the land that is most proximal and, and some of the most fertile land between these different household groups 
um, perhaps even in the radial wedges that Ian mentioned extending further away from the settlement. Jesse and, uh, and Jessica, do you want to say something about the animals? I think, Jesse, I think this is probably more your area. Sure. I mean, you you've done all the you've done all the work on the uh, on the isotopes to talk about the diversity of environments, but. Um, but it's, it's very, I mean, the isotopic work is really generalized. So it doesn't necessarily show the diversity of the landscape. It just shows animals mm -hmm. maybe eating different things. So there's no sense of like their distance in terms of distances. So in terms of what you've seen, how does that, how does that work? Yeah, I mean, I think we, in the uh, faunal remains we get, sort of, I think, a lot less specificity than you can get from the plants in terms of what kinds of environments they're in because the animals move. Um, but we do see uh, sort of a, a good variety of uh, animals that are living in sort of some of the drier areas with some of the equids um, and animals that are more sort of uh, better, uh, better suited to some of these wetter environments um, for, Frogs and chips. Um, so we do get some fish evidence, um, which uh, now I'm blanking on the people who uh, did the specific analysis, but some of the fish evidence does suggest that there are small, uh, small fish uh, that are generally living in these uh, uh, sort of would have been collected in uh, sort of probably shallow pools as they dry out over the year. Um, and then uh, we do have some evidence for uh, some of those microfauna that would be uh, like frogs. Uh, they're probably just living on the site itself because the site itself would probably have more uh, some of this water around um, from people storing it and just it's a much more complex sort of uh, environment uh, by being a mound on a big flat plain. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think we see a lot of this sort of variety, but for the major animals that we have, it's a lot of people moving them into the right areas and that uh, for the kind of forage that they could get. Um, and that's, I think, why you see the variety of the uh, diets from the sheep isotopes. And we also see that in cattle isotopes you've shown with, with a lot of the animals, they have a lot of variety. Uh, some of the things that we don't see, though, uh, we don't see a lot of pigs, which would be uh, are very common uh, at Banjuklahuyuk, uh, which is a very similar environment because um, it's relatively close by. Um, and so that suggests that on top of for being this uh, uh, environmental variability, there's also sort of cultural choices that are coming in uh, to how people are using these environments um, and what sort of resources they're going after. We have a lot of people, uh, a lot of evidence of uh, people going after cattle uh, wild cattle and probably some of the strontium isotopic evidence suggests that over time more of the cattle are coming from that plain, um, from that sort of Konya plain, which has a very, uh, I guess, it's not very well mapped up. It's a very, uh, the isotopic signature for that plain is going to be for a very wide area, uh, will be relatively similar, but we don't see uh, people going out into the hills to get them over time. So it might be people moving cattle closer into the areas uh, using some of these wetland environments um, for those. Has that more or less covered that? That was quite a complex question with, with lots of uh, a very full answer. Um, we do have another question from Femi Vermuck who asked whether, um, she mentions that you were talking about groupings in three different areas um, and how far they're connected. What types of groupings, basically groupings within extended families only? I don't understand that, three, three grouping, groupings. 
Um, I think she, she's asking, um, Fanny, I think you are asking about uh, the scale of the clusters, perhaps are these extended family groupings, are these uh, perhaps clusters around the history houses or are these radial, um, I think she's asking about the scale of the, of the clusters, um, whether these are individual households or they're multi-household cluster scales. Yeah, I, I um, I, it's, it's extremely difficult to to say. I mean, the, the um, I, I guess I would say that the the, the the smallest group of neighborhood is, you know, sort of like three or four houses, that that sort of thing. Um, but that. You know, there, there are sort of it's nested, and so it goes out and out and out, and probably different sort of le social levels. So probably very, very, very complicated. Um, and you know, in terms of where the people who lived, the, where the people who were buried in a house lived, um, we just really have no idea. The answer to that is what was, and and given that there are sixty-two people buried in one house, for example. That suggests we you know a very large social grouping of some some sort. So um, I I um, it, the more I work at Chatterhook, the more I realise that I just want to say all the time it's very complicated, and you know there isn't the simple answer. Um, I, I just think there are probably lots and lots of scales of cross cutting and interlapping and overlapping grouping, um, and that probably was continually changing. Okay, but the, um, the, the visibility of the data is not quite enough for us to tease out which of these various levels it is at different stages of time at, at the yeah. moment. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that, um, that makes sense. Can I, can I ask, just going off piece to you a little bit, whether there are um, noticeable differences between the north area and the south area when it comes to um, uses of... Uh, both animal um, resources and uh, agricultural resources, whether that's a distinction we can see. Jessica, do you want to reply to that? About the isotopes? I thought our north isotopes were too few in number to be able to say something about that. Is that, is that not right? Well, you would know. <laughs> I think that's kind of what I'm saying. I think that um, the problem, a problem we've had with the isotopic work has been that the um, preservation from the samples we've taken in the North Mound have been much worse than in the South. So the much more deeply buried deposits that you've been able to get to in the South have meant that we've got a lot more samples. So um, because we're dividing everything between um, species and then between all the different levels, because there is this fluctuation through um, the individual levels. Uh, I think it's been really difficult to compare the north um, with the south, um, to be honest, isotopically. Yeah. So, so the, in terms of the archaeology, the um, the Camillo, the work that Camillo Mazzucato did, that shows a clear difference between the north and the south. Um, but our, our main, the main evidence that I summarised, um, that again a Amy and Jess can, can Jesse can talk about. It is about difference in timing. There does, there does seem to be really, it's very intriguing, really, and, and strange, you know, <laughs> things happening at different rates on the two man, suggesting quite different communities in some way or other. Uh, we, 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 we're in, in the middle of a very, very large scale Bayesian based um, new dating program. So this might all get ref refined. But my impression from the initial work that that's produced is that it just supports that, supports the, uh, supports the evidence of things happening at different rates, different times in the two. So I, I don't know whether Je uh, Jesse and Amy want to say anything more about that. It's about the introduction of, of crops and, um, um, and animals. Um, sure. I mean, I, yeah, I think the... Yeah, the, the differences between the North and South are, uh, I guess, in a lot of ways, there are these very subtle changes. Um, I think uh, Jess's point of there being uh, preservation differences for the isotopic data, that 
that holds true for a lot of the different animals. I did my dissertation on the cattle there and had uh, very, very low success getting any. Uh, I think I took uh, maybe 50 samples and got a, a handful that successfully uh, got isotopic data out of them. Um, so it, it's that makes it really difficult to, to understand uh, some of those other kinds of changes. But from looking at animal bone sizes, um, that we can see that cattle get smaller over the course of the occupation at Chattahoyuk, and they sort of get smaller over the entire course of this. Um, you do see some subtle changes where the size diminution really starts to pick up um, in the north before it picks up in the south. And so you have, uh, again, the Bayesian modeling will give us a better idea of when, when these particular things happen, but it does seem to be uh, contemporary periods have, you know, size differences that would be on the order of one, one to two percent um, in the in the size of smaller cattle in the north than the south, and that suggests sort of a different uh, population, possibly of cattle that are being either hunted or herded or managed in some way um, during those periods. Uh, even though people obviously are interacting with each other within the mountain. Fantastic, thank you. I'm, I'm seeing questions coming in and a hand raised, so I'm going to move. Although I do, I do wonder, just as a coda to that, um, whether if it's mostly chronological that you see this change towards uh, the late period, would you expect to see even more entrenched clustering on, on the West Mound? Because is that, again, slightly later? Um, whether, I wonder if you can answer that very, very quickly before I go on to everyone else's questions. But there might... It's very difficult to know that the West Mound um, has mainly been dug near the surface, so it's very, very, very late, and we we don't really have a, a strong sense of of you know, changing sequences through time uh, on the West Mound. Okay, fantastic. Um, I'm going to then go to another question um, from Graham Barker first, and then I'll go to the raised hands. Um, Graham Barker has asked. Does the isotopic grazing and or foddering evidence show any kind of variability in terms of the ways that different groups, households or household groups are managing their animals in particular? I'm happy to answer this one. Um, I think in some ways, yes, and in other ways, no. So it's pretty much as Ian said, which is that when you look at some households, so one of the things we have tried to do is we have taken a huge number of isotopic samples. So. The key thing for our isotopic work there has always been to have um, representative, statistically analyzable data sets. So we've taken, um, I think now we've got about a thousand fordal isotopic measurements, including hundreds of um, sheep. So positively, as far as we can go with that, identified um, um, uh, species. So making sure we're distinguishing for the sheep from goats where we can. Um, and what they've shown is that you do get some clustering for some um, middens. So this has always been the difficulty is how you associate a midden to a house. Some middens do lap up against houses. So those have always been the ones we've tried to focus on. Um, other um, deposits are not clearly connected to houses. So we're, si we're simply looking at their spatial organization. Um, and a lot of them are some of the ones that have been mentioned in Camilla's work, for instance. What really struck me actually, at, from the evidence from the presentation today was looking at those um, houses where Ian showed there was one house which had a clustering of uh, isotopic values that were all less than minus 17 and then um, the other house which had mixtures of isotopic values which were um, um, minus 17 and then going up to minus 15. Now the significance of these is that um, it implicates C4 plants so having worked on the isotopic um, uh, look, looked at the isotopic data and done some of the work myself on the, the plant isotopes is that we've got more or less a cutoff for C14, C14, C4 consumption um, around about minus 18, maybe minus 18.5. So we know animals that have values which are um, beyond that, so minus 17 and onwards, um, are probably partly C4 consumers. So that does suggest that unless it's a seasonal issue, so some of these clusters could be, as Ian said before, there could be um, seasonal behaviours or 
different types of deposits. So you could have a feasting deposit or you could have a long term household deposit, assuming none of those factors are going on. And those are all controllable because it's very detailed taphonomic um, data that's collected from the faunal team for um, the de faunal deposits. Um, assuming, assuming none of those things are going on, then they could very easily be um, herding animals in different ways for different households. It's certainly not something, if you look across one level, for instance, it's certainly not um, a, a uniform behaviour across the whole um, across the whole sort of constrained time period or even in a particular house. It's very similar to the, the human isotope values. So you have some houses you'll have clustering and that's when you control for age as well. So we've even um, we've had so many samples that we've controlled for age in the adults. Um, you get some clustering, as Ian showed, and then you get other households which are very unclustered, um, even within the same age group. Um, so that's been, um, yeah, so I guess the answer is, as Ian says, it's very complicated and complex. Fantastic. I'm now going to invite uh, Doug Baird to ask a question you've been patiently waiting with your hand up for a while. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. No, that's great. It's more difficult in this webinar mode to know. Uh, I, I wasn't even sure I'd raise my hand. Yeah, so uh, I just wanted to follow up on the interesting results you got um, in terms of the contrast between now um, North and South um, in terms of subtle differences in, in animal and plant management. And I just wondered in terms of the other sorts of network analysis that you've done, whether uh, you have... Um, perhaps um, cross-cutting that, uh, strong links between shared um, forms of decoration of the houses or artifact types or, or anything like that? Or on the whole, does the sort of network analysis show more distinctions between North and South than there are cross-cutting links? Yeah, I, 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 um, I keep trying to tie Camilla down in terms of um, that. But what, what she ends up saying is that the strongest signal is some sort of proximity factor, so neighborhoodness at different levels, but that there is clear, clear evidence of cross-cutting things as well. So, so that you, so, you know, if you look at a clusters, you often find a sort of cluster of houses um, and then another cluster of houses over here but that one there's one one house in this in this cluster that's from the wrong area you know it's from so these are clusters based just simply on similarity and then you see whether they're in the same place or not so they, they're all in one place but they're, they're, there's one or two houses that are actually you know from the north area or something that have got into that so you have this very strange, again, this no, annoying sort of no clear pattern emerges. Um, so both those things, which is why I was trying to emphasize that both those things seem to be true. But the, the differences between the North and the South in terms of her analysis are very subtle. They're, they're things to do with whether the highest platform is in the Northwest or the Northeast corner of the house. Uh, because in the south they tend to be in the northeast, and the north they tend to be in the northwest. Um, uh, what, you know where the side room is, whether there are pillars in the house. Um, I, I don't think decoration types of decoration hasn't proven to be to be um, be distinctive. Um, so basically, the the whole site is very similar. The houses are very similar, and they're all mixed up. But there are these, you know, there is this pattern of north and south being different. Right. Does that answer, does that answer your question, Doug? I'm yeah, sure. I think so. It's a sort of exploration, isn't it, of, of this yeah. stuff, because the patterns are so complex. So yeah. that's very useful. Thanks to Thank you. Ian and, and everyone. Very interesting. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, for Doug, for that question. Rosie Bishop asks, to what extent are seeds from dung charred as fuel mixed with crop processing waste? Shall I take that one? <laughs> um, 
Thanks, Rosie. So the we do get lots of mixtures of fuel residues and other things, but when we can resolve things down, as I was mentioning before, to in situ burning, we start to see the difference. So we get uh, fuel residues primarily in fire spots and in fire installations. Uh, and those are very variously dung or wood fuel dominated dung, especially outdoors, wood, especially indoors. But of course, there's mixtures of that. And then the dehusking debris that uh, Ian mentioned are spreads that we see across those dirty floors. Um, so the for in situ burning, the, the primary dehusking signal is coming from the dirty part of the indoor space. Uh, but again, they're smearing in every conceivable direction, and you can certainly find dehusking debris anywhere anywhere you look. So I'm talking about the overall tendency when we do multivariate statistics, correspondence analysis. Right, I'm going to, to speed up because I want to see if I can cr cram in another few questions before half past the hour. Um, we've got a question from Louise and Martin who asks whether we get any sense that the sheep isotope variation might relate to keeping some part of the flock close, perhaps linking with milking and herding others um, in a more distant way. Jessica? I'm happy to kind of partly answer this. So um, obviously the... Um, a lot of the evidence we had came from Liz Henton's work on this. Um, one of the difficulties we've had is that um, strontium work is, is in some ways um, easy because of something that Jesse mentioned, which is that um, the, uh, the Konya Basin is a um, uh, kind of um, homogenous geological um, entity, but this makes it difficult obviously to sort of look at any distance in terms of where sheep might be going. Now we can look at the, the variation between the, the basin versus the terraces and, and further that way, but my recollection, um, and also from the oxygen isotope work that I think she did, is there isn't a lot moving in that direction. I think it's all staying relatively local. How we would get at whether and what, what kind of secondary products were being exploited through that, I don't know. Jesse, is this something you've got an idea on? Uh, I mean, I think we have some evidence from the, uh, I guess, from the survivorship profiles of the, the manuals that we have. We don't have, uh, we have a lot of them. Uh, and so we have sort of a relatively good sense of when um, a lot of the animals are being killed um, that show up at the site. That might be one of the issues when you do have um, animals that are being herded further away. Um, if, if those remains are not being brought back to the site, but we don't have um, necessarily the, the some of the really distinctive patterns that you might find if it's very focused on milk production. Um, I do know, uh, was it Sharpie Pitter uh, had done some work on uh, milk residues on pottery uh, found at the site. So we do know that there is milk that does get collected by people at the site. I don't know if she was able to separate, or I guess knowing that it's ruminant milk. Um, and so from uh, sort of the sheep or the goat or the cattle, um, I guess one thing that is also useful is knowing that the contemporary levels of uh, the Pen Penarbusha um, rock shelter uh, that's further south on the on the Konya Basin has a, has a sheep assemblage that's extremely focused on uh, immature animals, like very young animals. Um, and that might be something that is sort of a seasonal herding station. And if those are, there are some potential links uh, to the people that uh, were there and the people who live at Chattahoyuk um, at contemporary times, that could be a sense of people moving animals more distantly. And yeah, you know, when, when those animals are killed sort of far from the site, we're not getting them then at the site, so we don't know necessarily what the, um, I guess, what the dynamics of that would be in terms of products. That is true, actually. The, the Pinabasha um, 7th millennium um, sheep do overlap with the Chattahoyuk of the later levels. 
Um, so there is some correlation there, but I think the difficulty is always knowing whether or not that correlation is is a, a distance one or a, yeah. yeah, that's always the, you know, because a lot of it we're dealing with it, uh, variations in C3 plants and there is some, there is C4 that comes in at times, but there's a lot of animals that don't have that. And the, the differentiation between the different plants that are being consumed and the areas that they're using, it's too, it's not fine grained enough, I don't think, to actually um, get into a um into sort of reconstructing that level of um animal management i think well i think we might zoom out then for we've got two questions which are not about the fine grain which are about um a kind of a broader interpretive frame for um chatel as a whole we have one question asked by an anonymous attendee um, whether you think that Chattel might Chattel Hewitt might be an early example of anarcho-communism and do you think your evidence supports this? And I think we can perhaps take this along with uh, a question by Neriman Oza, who asks about um, whether these various different forms of social organization that you have, um, does it give evidence for groups living in peace without strict separations um, between groups of blood relatives and others? Is this something that we can infer? So this is a broader set of interpretations about um, harmony, community, and anarcho-communism. Well, who wants to take these? Go on. <laughs> What is the word? Arco communism? Anarcho communism. Anarcho communism. Yeah, I, I am. Um, Chattanooga is, is often used uh, as an example of um, early societies living without violence, uh, fairly egalitarian, um, peaceful. And so on. So it becomes an you know idealized in in that way. The the human remains team that we've been working with uh, more recently has um, argued that in fact there is lots of evidence of blunt force trauma on the skull, uh, suggesting that that um, there was violence, even the, even if it might have been quite ritualized and, and controlled. Um, Um, there are, of course, great debates about you know, wh what, the, what some of the artifacts that Chattahoochee were used for. There are things called clay balls that, we, that, that I think were used for cooking, uh, but other people argue might have been used for throwing at each other and creating these blunt force traumas and so on. And, and there are certain, uh, certainly spear and arrowheads and things like that. Um, I, I, I imagine the Chattahoochee it was an extremely, um, again, it's difficult to say anything general. I mean, in, in many ways, very conformist, very, a lot of similarity between each, each of the houses, you know, highly conformist in many ways. But as we've been saying, there's also a lot of variability, so it's difficult. But, um, but I, 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 I imagine it was a society that was uh, quite uh, uh, oppressive in the sense that if you didn't fit in, you left. Uh, and that, um, I mean, I don't have a lot of evidence for that, but, but um, an example of the sort of evidence that, that we have for that is that um, uh, there are some, nearly everybody is buried uh, in a house. There are some people who are buried in middens, and there are a couple of people buried in middens uh, um, that um, have... Uh, skeletal remains that suggest a lifelong um, disability or trauma of various sorts. Uh, so it suggests, you know, they're discarding or putting outside or, or keeping away people that sort of don't fit into the norm. Um, uh, so I, I but that, that's, I mean, there's very little evidence to sort of base that sort of uh, statement on. But what I would say there is a lot of evidence for is, um, to do with whether there was real social hierarchy at Chattahoochee. And I've just 
written a paper that's coming out in the Cambridge Archaeological Journal, which looks at looks at this. But but in my view, there's really good evidence at Chattelhuyu that people um, that there was incipient that people were trying in various ways to create social hierarchy, but that there was a very strong social ethic of dampening it and stopping it and limiting it. Uh, and um, so that it, I wouldn't say it was a communist society, it was more like a sort of segmentary society in my view. Um, but, but it was, was, was not one that um, accepted large scale uh, social difference and hierarchy um, and control. Would anyone else like to come in on that before we wrap up for the evening? It's a, it's a big topic. I think we could add something here from the strontium isotope data. So we have a paper which we're producing at the moment looking at the um, uh, evidence for local or non-local um, individuals such as who. So because it's such a big site, obviously one of the questions has always been um, how are there so many people there? Is it to do with um, fertility? And the human remains team have always argued that it has been. But obviously, um, another way of looking at that is from the strontium isotope work. <clears throat> so because of this homogenized um, Konya Basin, that where the site is located, we can actually establish whether or not people are from that Konya Basin area, which is relatively constrained, not the Konya whole area. Um, or from outside that, because you have the limestone terraces which um, occur around the edges of the plain. And what we've seen so far, so we haven't, we've done quite a lot of samples as strontium isotope analysis goes, um, but we've done about 80 people, I think, um, out of the whole site. And so far, we've only got a handful of people who are beyond the Konya um, plain basin itself. So that suggests that the people who are, um, uh, participating in the in the site are from the local area and that's from childhood as well so those signatures are childhood mm -hmm. signatures so they're still there um, in there when they're buried at the site but there are one or two outsiders um, or a small handful of outsiders one thing we when we've looked at the um, uh, evidence of their burial are they different are they all buried in the same house we actually find they're distributed across houses they have nothing particularly um, notable in terms of any grave goods. So they're basically people that you would otherwise not realise were outsiders except for the strontium isotope work. So that's one thing maybe that's, I don't know if Ian, Ian's moving around quite a lot. I don't know if he agrees or disagrees at this point. <laughs> oh, I think that's absolutely right. Very, very, very interesting. It's, uh, exactly, yeah. I think you had to be integrated at Chattel Reed. That's extremely interesting. I am I'm very crucially aware that we are over our time limit of half past the hour. I do just want to mention there was one final question that came in from Mesut Ilgin, who asked about um, young people being interested and excited in cultural heritage in Turkey. I'm afraid that's probably not a question that we can answer definitively here in this seminar. But I do hope that the kinds of things that we have heard about today are the kinds of things that will encourage young people in Turkey to get more and more excited um, about archaeology. Um, and I don't know if any of the panelists have anything to add on that topic. Um, but if not, I think I shall leave it for this evening, especially since we have had so much to discuss that we are running over time. I'd like to say a very big thank you to Ian, Jessica, Jesse, Claudia and Amy in the order that they appear on my screen. And thank you very much to all of the participants for all of your questions um, and for your attention as well. Um, look forward to seeing as many of you as possible um, in our next Anatolian Studies virtual seminar coming up soon. Thank you all very, very much and have a lovely evening or day wherever you happen to be in your time zone.